Welcome back to another episode of the Blockchain Scholars Podcast. My name is Daniel Liebau, an affiliate faculty member at Singapore Management University, and I am your host for today. First, I want to thank our sponsor VChain for their continued support. Without Sunny and Sarah's help, this podcast would simply not exist. Today's guest is outstanding and one of the first to ever research blockchain from an economist's perspective. He's a full professor at the Rotman School of Management at Toronto University. Welcome, Professor Dr. Joshua Gans. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for coming today. And um, it's really, really a big pleasure to have you. What's the title of the paper that we're going to talk about today? And um, what was really the research question that you were set out to investigate with that paper? So the paper is uh, some simple economics of the blockchain. We wrote it uh, almost a decade ago now. Uh, it took a little time before we published it. The paper was basically trying to understand if there were going to be applications on the blockchain other than just uh, speculation on cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. What was it that the blockchain was providing that would uh, basically unlock <laughs> some economic potential? This is a thing that we would do um, quite often in our work on technology is in understanding, trying to understand what is it that a technology was really doing uh, beyond the sort of jargon and technical terms of it. And so I've previously done this type of work with respect to artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence was notoriously hard to understand exactly what, what it was doing. And uh, we came to the conclusion, having looked at the technology, that it was really an advance in statistics, um, mm -hmm. and in particular, the statistics of prediction. Yeah. Once you understood that, I start to draw out the implications of what would happen with that technology. Got it. And um, when you talk about blockchain in this context, um, can you clarify, are you only referring to public blockchains or or also the what some people call the private blockchains? It really was uh, both that we had in mind. Uh, okay. The public blockchains were certainly the interesting innovation in that regard, uh, but even private blockchains or blockchains that were permissioned uh, to some degree uh, had a lot of these potential qualities to them. Okay, interesting. And um, so, so this paper is more a theory paper, is that fair to say? It's not, not really an empirical paper, right? Well, it isn't an empirical paper. There was nothing to empiric on, and maybe even right to the present day too, uh, is that the applications uh, that people were hoping to see from the blockchain, um, I think, well, it certainly hadn't occurred then. And uh, it's safe to say they haven't quite occurred now. Yeah, no, that's true. The adoption remains remains very low true um so so in simple terms and, and having in mind that this podcast is really geared towards practitioners right what is that theory that you came up with or what are the kind of main points that you're making in the paper so the real uh starting point is just remembering what it is that a blockchain can do and it all started with this paper by scott stanetta and stuart haber back mm -hmm. in 1990 called how to timestamp a digital document that paper basically invented the blockchain what it did was come up with uh, this method by which if you uh, produced a document five years ago that was digital and then you wanted to refer to that document today there are all sorts of issues associated with it for instance you know this document might be a contract mm -hmm. and uh, the contract has terms etc and so you sign the contract and party A got the contract and party B got the contract. And then now five years later, they got to dispute what, you know, uh, what are the terms in it? You can imagine scenarios because it's a purely digital contract whereby one party could assert that the contract that they signed was a different one from what was really signed. And there'd be really no way for a court to tell which was the true document. Um, when you had physical documents and other things like that, you might have been able to store them in a certain place or uh, whatever to check them. But digital documents were more notorious to that effect. And you could, of course, store with a trusted third party who would resolve the dispute. That would be the old way of doing things. Um, yeah. And it's costly for all sorts of reasons, because you basically have to 
do that for all documents that have to be retrieval you have to really trust the party which of course you know that can lead to all sorts of things what was it that the blockchain could do the blockchain could automatically and without incurring the storage costs timestamp a document so in our little situation we signed a, a contract five years ago we've got a dispute today the blockchain doesn't store the document but what the blockchain does is you assert it's one thing i assert it's another and then we can check which one of ours if any <laughs> is the one that was time stamped five years ago uh, yeah. which sort of says well that was what we agreed to surely and so you can do that that process in other words what it does is while you previously needed a trusted third party or you might need a court to do that verification process the blockchain allowed you to verify potentially fairly costlessly and uh it was sort of verification that rather than during every time a, a dispute came up uh, if it became really cheap to do so you could verify all the time yeah and so that was the insight of our paper our, mm -hmm. our paper was what does the blockchain do does this verification it automates it and it makes it really cheap and yeah. then you're next going to see well, where is that valuable so so you have uh, i think two key concepts one is the the cost of verification which you just talked about but then if i if i remember correctly there's also cost of networking do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about that angle yes so that was a less precise one but the idea is fairly simple is that it, it's very hard um and costly for anyone building software or, or anything like it to build something that is secure important to greeks and what the blockchain potentially allows you to do is to sort of cobble together potentially low cost quite a secure thing or at least secure on some dimensions precisely the reason why all the other issues associated with cryptocurrency and fraud aside at least the the, the token part um if you get your code right is not hard to do um which is why we've seen bitcoin and ethereum and all these ones uh be so robust for so long Uh, so that was a potentially another benefit as well. It's distinct from the first one, but it was one we identified. Okay. And um, would that cost of networking be particularly pronounced in the public blockchains? Or do you see that uh, as, as a benefit for the private ones as well, and to, to what extent? I think basically the, the security element comes from this. When you have a large centralized database, if someone hacks that, you know, they can hack it through a single point of entry. With a blockchain, even private or public, in order to hack a blockchain, you've got to basically control a majority of the nodes or some large portion of the nodes. So that means that you have to hack all of those. <laughs> um, so that basically makes uh, the cost of an attack uh, that much greater. So, which is why we have seen, you know, some of the most uh, significant databases in the world hacked um but for blockchains that necessarily wouldn't necessarily be the case mm -hmm. yeah fair um so so these two insights um what do i do with them if i sit inside of a of a large corporation or if i'm a startup what, what do i do with that with that insight that's where it becomes uh tricky the modern economy runs on uh being able to verify all, all sorts of things and being able to trust lots of things yeah What you have to look for in looking for applications of the, of the blockchain is areas where the trust mechanism or the formal court mechanism just doesn't work. And, uh, you know, one can imagine uh, scenarios like that, but that's what you've got to look for. My favorite one is like the problem of international trade. I see an ad on Instagram, I order the thing, it comes and it's not what I expected. And there's no real recourse to that. <laughs> you know, there's no court to take it to. The best thing you can do is leave, leave a negative review, but even that as an imperfect mechanism. So you can imagine situations in which you could develop a smart contract that would be able to sit over the top of that. That would allow uh, that verification to occur and for some of those gaps to be closed. And maybe in a significant way that you could really unlock a mm. whole lot of this market that's currently deterred because people have had experience and they don't click on the Instagram ad anymore. So those would be the sorts of things you'd be looking for in trying to find these applications. And, you know, I 
have to admit, about a decade ago, I thought, well, there might be many of these sorts of things. But I thought it would be very useful for the allocation of royalties. Large movie studios or even authors publishing books don't have very good insight into what the, where the royalties are coming from and things like that. There were some aspects of supply chain management that people talk about all the time, which, you know, you could see a, a path of verification and also security to that, that it would come to play, but we haven't quite seen that. That suggests to me, at the moment, you ask me, uh, you know, we did a theoretical paper. Now, theoretical papers can be right or wrong. What's the probability that it's right? Much lower than it was 10 years ago. <laughs> mm. <laughs> or alternatively, there is some impediment in the way that's getting into the way of that. And I could speculate what that might be. But ultimately, yeah, you know, despite a whole lot of promise and despite a lot of people understanding some of these basic points, um, I think it's safe to say the blockchain is still doing what it was doing 15 years ago. Fair enough. And um, keeping all of that in mind and perhaps also the, the low progress of this industry that has been built on top of this technology, what do you think are sort of the interesting uh, areas to explore further, perhaps also from a from a research perspective. Like, what would you look at next, or what are you looking at next in that space? So, if I had to pick an impediment to all of this, remember the whole idea is to make verification cheap. One of the issues associated with that is that each uh, thing you want verified is another transaction on a blockchain. And the problem is that certainly the main blockchains, uh, large blockchains, the, the fees associated with it, uh, and in particular the public one, are just uh, way too high. I mean, these are supposed to drop to virtually nothing <laughs> in order to be able to uh, run, you know, all of these transactions. Uh, but they've, you know, they, as you know, they fluctuate and they've been quite high. So I think the next frontier, these networks don't necessarily take that much to run. Um, the reason we have high fees is because it's sort of we're designed to do that in order to provide security. An attack is how many nodes can you control? And so what you need to do is you need to make sure that people don't control the nodes. Well, at the moment, the way that's done is by making it very expensive <laughs> to, <laughs> to control a node, become a oh. miner those sorts of things or well, you know in terms of the amount of stake you need to hold um the question is whether you can design this better that you might be able to avoid some of those things but yeah. at the moment that's an issue now it's not an issue for the private blockchains or a permissioned blockchain it can be very low it's not clear whether this is the critical thing i mean the the interesting thing about the fees in my mind is that perhaps the bigger problem than high fees is actually the high variance in fees. Because if you're a user of a platform, you kind of want to predict how much you have to pay for some sort of service. But right now on, on, on platforms like Ethereum, for example, the variance is so high that it, it becomes very difficult to predict these, these transaction costs. I think in the main that also uh causes another issue which is one of the issues was you're supposed to the security and low verification is by having large numbers of small players control the thing you know, no, no one gets too big okay. so what's the way you get around fees and fee variance in particular uh, you have these large aggregators who sit between you and the blockchain who bundle up a whole lot of transactions together, get it to count as one transaction on the blockchain. That's how they get the costs down for everybody. But the, the problem associated with that is, of course, you now have the large player. <laughs> um, so the variance in fees is, is an issue for users. And where that leads to is large players sitting between you and the blockchain. And um, as soon as you start to have that, you have to, do I trust them? <laughs> you know? Back to uh, square one. <laughs> all of these, every single issue we've had with this industry between a user and the blockchain uh, not being trusted. That is a significant hurdle. And, and in the end, do you get anything from the blockchain if it's really you're just dealing with another large entity uh, who at some point can sort of say, you know, I don't know why we're using the blockchain at all. You basically have to trust us. So, you know, the, it seems to sort of undermine itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see how it all develops. Joshua, thank you so much for joining us today. I think it's very, very insightful um, comments that you made, also sharing a little bit more about your paper. I think you just crossed a thousand citations, so that is uh, <laughs> quite something. 
Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch and look forward to more of your research work, yeah? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And by the way, I, uh, I, I had a book I wrote uh, last year called The Economics of Blockchain Consensus. So those who are interested in some of the more technical aspects of all of this, uh, there's that book. Yeah, that book is, um, I read it and it made me reconsider um, how I run my introductory class to blockchain. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very good book. Excellent. That's terrific. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into the Blockchain Scholars podcast today. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Joshua and now better understand the value proposition of distributed ledgers. Please follow us on LinkedIn and YouTube and share this episode with friends, colleagues, and anyone else you believe could benefit from it. I thank VeChain again for their support, and I see you next month with another brand new episode of our podcast.